Welcome to the Jurassic Park cast. The Jurassic Park podcast where guests chat with me about Michael Crichton's 1990 novel, Jurassic Park, and also Not That Too. I'm Ryan Rogers, and also a big dumb Jurassic Park fan. Welcome to episode 6, New York, recorded here on the first day of spring, March 21st, 2022. Thanks for joining me today. You're listening to Snail's Super Groovy, and the outro today is T-Shirts. Thanks again to Snail and Christoph Oaks for the use of his music, and you can find his album on Spotify and Bandcamp. We have some corrections today. First, a tornado infused with oil, ignited, and then sent burning and barreling across the countryside. It wouldn't be cool. It would be tragic. And apologies to all those that were affected. That was insensitive. Ypres is apparently in Belgium, not in France. In, in Windsor, there are street signs that commemorate uh, battles that Canadians took, uh, took place in during the First World War. And, and one of the streets is named Ypres. I, I just thought it was in France because, well, I didn't know any better and I still don't. Uh, so my apologies. It's, it's in Belgium and it's pronounced Ypres, not Ypres or whatever I was doing. My apologies. Also, Germans apparently do have a sense of humor. I haven't seen it, but an absence of evidence isn't an evidence of absence. Uh, And finally, apologies to my wife. This section continues to be a source of concern for her every time it comes out, so I am sorry. In dinosaur news, a new paper published by eLife named A New Early Branching Armored Dinosaur from the Lower Jurassic of Southwestern China has named a new species of ankylosaur relative. The early Jurassic period is significantly underrepresented in the fossil record, and as a result... However, it was that the world went from late Triassic coelophysoid like dinosaurs and the bigger platyosaurs and then jumped into the stegosaurus, brachiosaurus, and allosaurus categories is still sadly poorly understood. It's like the middle step in the profit plan for the underpants gnomes. Phase one, basal dinosaurs. Phase two, phase three, super theropods and dinosaurs as big as buildings. I don't get it. Well, this new discovery is a clue to what phase two may have been. Like, To put how poorly understood this is, there are two general groups of dinosaurs, the bird and the lizard-hipped ones. And where the bird-hipped ones come from, nobody really knows. But somewhere in the early Jurassic, they did something that turned them into huge stegosaurs, iguanodons, and chylosaurs, and triceratops. And equally, something turned those little coelophysoids into allosaurs, and spinosaurs, and tyrannosaurs, and the platyosaurs into the animals that are like as big as walking whales. To answer the question of what on earth happened there, paleontologists need more clues, and this little new discovery is one of them. Yushisaurus kopchikai has been announced, and this mysterious Chinese lizard is named after the Yushi locality and honors John J. Kopchik. Frankly, not only are we lacking dinosaurs from the early Jurassic, but also dinosaurs with a name that starts with the letter Y, so welcome to Yushisaurus. The holotype CVEB 21701, housed at the Center for Vertebrate Evolutionary Biology, was excavated from the Fengjiao Formation. It's comprised of a partial skeleton including parts of the skull and at least 120 osteoderms. The paper describes Yushisaurus as a new, very primitive, thyreophoran, a group which includes stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. If it's as closely related to thyreophorans as it's believed, it would have had plenty of armor on it, which would have likely been found in longitudinal rows along its body, and likely was herbivorous with a small brain and featuring four limbs that are shorter than the rear. The comparison in the literature is to Scalidosaurus, if you want to look it up, because Scalidosaurus is pretty well known and has been a dinosaur in literature since the 1850s. So you can look that up. And while you're looking that up, Get yourself comfortable and prepare to be punctual. Are you ready? You feeling comfy? Ready to rock? Ready. Oh, and there's the timer. Hey, we're right on time. All right. (laughs) Uh, With me for some fun this episode is paleontology educator, paleontologist, and dinosaur hunter Joe Codal, famously known as and celebrated as Paleo Joe. 
Uh, for more than 30 years, Paleo Joe has been in front of tens of thousands of children, students doing educational outreach, as well as leading excursions out to dig sites. And last year, he received the Charles H. Sternberg Medal from the Association of Applied Paleontological Sciences. Charles H. Sternberg Medal is awarded for outstanding lifetime achievement in the field of paleontology and or for fostering cooperation, communication, and understanding between professional, amateur, and academic paleontologists. So congratulations on that achievement. That's really well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we met on the set... Uh, during the filming of Spaceballs, we were waiting in line for John Candy's autograph when Mel Brooks started roasting me and Joe came to my defense. So thank you very much for helping me save face in front of John Absolutely. Candy and uh, and for coming on the podcast to chat about Jurassic Park with me. You got it. So you're telling me that you, uh, you've you enjoyed the novel Jurassic Park better than you enjoyed the film Jurassic Park. What were some of the things that you were happier with the book about? Well, you know, the book, you can really delve into a lot more detail than you mm. can uh, in a movie. A uh, movie is is very dramatic, as the book is dramatic as well, but the movie is trying to capture your visual uh, senses and, and shock you and awe you that way, whereas the book really can delve into a lot of the details, uh, uh, especially, like I said, for getting inside the brain of the, of the creature. Mm-hmm. What's the creatures, what are the creatures thinking? How are they acting? Why are they acting the way they are? And Crichton did a good job of that. Yeah. Uh, and again, the movie, you can't really tell you know, what's going on in, in that respect. Yeah, um, having the paleontologist try and interpret the behaviors it kind of gives you yeah that insight into why might this dinosaur be doing a particular action versus just watching and guessing i suppose so it is you're right there's this right. guidance that's able to to be provided which is good i'm going to try and talk about uh, later on in this episode of the podcast uh, chaos theory is chaos theory anything you're, <laughs> you're conversational about can you give me any tips no i just love it yeah. um it, it's kind of it's kind of uh I, I love uh, in, in the movie when Malcolm, you know, was mm-hmm. talking about chaos theory. It's just tremendous. I'm kind of a little bit of a believer in that. I don't really follow and study that, but yeah, things happen all the time and, and changes the course of uh, of history, changes the the direction of something. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful wonderful thing. I found that there are there are three qualities that are necessary for something to be considered uh, a part of chaos theory, and I was kind of following along with the first somewhat following along with the second and then the third i was like i'm lost (laughs) but uh so that's gonna be a tough one but we'll get there so you have common expertise with some of the characters and things that happen in the book which is pretty cool stuff that happened in the book are things that you have literally done uh like going on excavations are there are there any of your excavations like what grant and sattler are portrayed doing like do rich contributors helicopter in to offer you thousands of dollars in consultancy fees um no no (laughs) (laughs) We uh, we rely a lot on uh, uh, grants, especially uh, from individuals, uh, corporations, to uh, actually get get the digs underway. Uh, we rely a tremendous amount on volunteers. One of the groups that I dig with, the Burpee Museum out of Rockford, Illinois, they actually lead people out to the field. You actually dig side by side with paleontologists. They have a, a one week time frame where you can go out and, and dig with them. Then they go to Montana, do the same thing. I, I usually dig in, in Utah. Um, but really, in the beginning of the, of the movie, you know, you saw Grant and mm-hmm. everybody down on the ground, you know, brushing with a with a brush. That's kind of what happens. Yeah. Uh, and the skeleton does not look like that. No. Uh, when I was in Utah. <laughs> I was in Utah digging up a Camarasaurus I found about 15 years ago, and uh, the main crew was over on one hill digging up some Allosaurus material and some Stegosaurus material, and I was kind of by myself I'm a loner I went to the other side of a hill and I started sweeping with a very large push broom and I'm brushing the sand away just like you saw in the yeah. movie and I found a small piece of bone well I took my push broom and threw it over my shoulder picked up my paintbrush then started brushing away I ended up with a tibia of a, of a long neck dinosaur of Camarasaurus wow. that was about four feet long well then I continued to dig and continued to sweep around and I found uh, the fibula I found part of the sacrum. I found a couple of ribs. Then I moved over to another location about six or seven feet away. Sweeping again, I found another small piece of bone. Swept it off, cleaned it off, and turned out to be a humerus. And then I found the coracoid. So really what I discovered was the central part of the dinosaur. I found uh, yeah. the arms yeah. and the chest. I found ribs and I found the back legs. Normally what happens is a lot of the small bones are gone. For example, with the, the dinosaur, we only found about 55% of it. Mm-hmm. The head and neck were gone, the tail was gone, and all the fingers and toes were gone because it was deposited in a river. And the river had kind of washed away all the small bones, leaving the larger bones behind mm-hmm. in a big old pile. That's fascinating. So it was articulated, which is incredible. Partially articulated. Yeah. Uh, partially. What was left, uh, yeah. A lot of times what happens is 
there are scavengers. The scavengers, just like today, the scavengers come by and tear the creature apart. I just got back from a, a dig in uh, South Dakota. Well, now because of COVID three years ago, oh. uh, where we were digging in a place that was, uh, again, a river. And it's uh, known uh, for its uh, T-Rex teeth. You find T-Rex teeth everywhere. And you find broken pieces of bone, busted up bones. I found a bunch of turtle scutes. And that was a dinosaur feeding area where somebody had died in a river, floated downstream, got stuck on a sandbar, and here come the rexes. Mm -hmm. And they're eating bits and pieces off that. As they're eating, they're breaking off their teeth. Sure. That area is very rich in uh, T-Rex teeth. That tells us it was a dinosaur feeding area. I'm going to close my email so I don't get any more notifications like that. <laughs> Amazing stuff. And uh, I've been hearing that the, like a T-Rex's teeth are pretty tough for them to be snapping off. They're really just giving her... To, yeah. to eat whatever they got. Yeah, tre tremendous, tremendous bite force. Yeah. But, you know, if, as you can imagine, back then, T-Rex didn't have a knife and fork. Nope. He could use to cut his meat away yeah. from the bone. So as he's crunching through the carcass, he's hitting large bones, uh, leg bones, and, and breaking off his teeth. But that's not a problem because his teeth were constantly growing. Not like a, a shark where they roll forward. Mm -hmm. His teeth would grow up from the root, from the bottom. So even if he didn't break it off while he was eating, eventually the tooth coming in would push the other tooth out of the way. Mm -hmm. And normally what we find there is we find broken teeth. We find the tops of the teeth. If we find a rooted tooth, then we know that that creature died, started to decay, the teeth fell out of his mouth. Oh. But if they're broken, that tells us it was an active feeding that broke that tooth. That's amazing. I like that the, those interpretations that take some oh, time to develop. Tells, yeah, fossils tell us wonderful stories. They tell us a lot about the, the, the creatures, how they lived, how they died, you know, what they did, things like that. Wonderful stuff. You also provide, is it guided excursions? Is that right? You take families or groups to scramble around the yeah, Badlands? Yeah, I, I, I do that here in Michigan. Yep. Unfortunately, we don't have any dinosaurs in yep. Michigan, uh, so I have to travel out west. But I do lead uh, families on trips up north. We dig in uh, Devonian sediments, which are 380, 360 million years old. Uh, we're finding lots of corals, crinoid seashells, things like that. But dinosaur digging, got to go out west. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever get, like... Um some bag-eyed punk kid who decides he's going to challenge your interpretation of a fossil like in the movie all the time yeah and, and, okay okay and, and it's not punk kids either no. uh, i was at a rock show this weekend and this guy came in and he brought in this big old rock and said look at the duck i found okay uh, it's not a duck and actually i could show him where the coral was and the yeah and, no no this is a duck and then he then i, I apologize he pulled out a, a what do you call it a heart it was a piece of pinkish stone that kind of looked like a heart. There were a couple holes in it. Okay. See, that's where, the, that's where the veins and arteries go. This is a heart. It's a preserved. No, no come on, guy. It's, <laughs> it's not. I, I get that all the time. What's really great is when I do talk to kids, I can explain to them, you know, well, the, the fossilization process does this. Well, erosion and water wear does this. Mm -hmm. And the kids understand it. You get some adults, and that's, that's what it is. I told you, that's a duck, and that's a duck. And they just don't listen. I've heard psychologically it, that when you believe something and somebody tries to argue against it, that that makes you more entrenched. Like, it's very hard to convince somebody otherwise of something. There's exactly. been a lot of that over the last two years about the psychology of getting people, like convincing people one way or the oh, other. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and the hard part is, you know, you try to be as kind as you can, but after they, they beat you for five minutes saying, no, you're wrong, <laughs> I say, I'm, I'm sorry, that's my opinion. Take it to any museum you like and, and get their opinion. Right. And that's how I finally have to end it off because they, they just... That's what it is, and that's where they're going with it. Okay. Well, you've given this whole section of the movie so much more credibility than I ever would have given it, so that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> to walk a mile in your shoes, I guess, right? Well, it's, it's, it's a riot. I yeah. mean, you're the first person that finds these things. You know, you're, you're discovering ancient life. And, and what's really cool about it also is not only do you find the dinosaurs, but you find other things around there. Yeah. Uh, for example, when I dig in Utah, uh, we know that it was a river because we find clams, we find mussels. Mm -hmm. And that tells you this was a freshwater environment if you've got clams and mussels. And we can see the cross bedding in the side of the hill where you've got uh, this great, have you got some time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is really good. Uh, in the one area, we uh, actually, we can see the river because as it, the cliff eroded and fell away, we can actually see cross bedding. We can see layers of very fine sand where the river went very, very slowly and just deposited fine grains. Then you see little tiny pebbles that's where the water picked up. Maybe there was a rainstorm, you know, upriver mm -hmm. and it brought down heavier pebbles. Maybe there was a deluge. The next layer's got huge, you know, cobbles and pebbles, and that was brought down by the river. Then you got fine 
grain sand again. And this goes on. It's like a layer cake. And sandwiched in between that layer cake are where we find those bones. Mm -hmm. And some of the bones, uh, again, if they're small, they get washed very far downstream. And the large ones kind of stay right there, accumulated in one great big spot. I think there's, let's call it a misunderstanding that because dinosaurs have been extinct for so long and we don't have a tremendous amount of the entire picture available, that there is a lot of guesswork. But as you're describing, a lot of what is declared to people is like evidenced by stuff that the people that, that is found. The stuff that people do have the gumption to say this is probably what happened are things that they have evidence to support as opposed to the speculative nature of things. Like when I see pictures of, um, you often see a picture of a stegosaurus kind of in that tripo uh, tripod position reaching up. And there was a paper that said that. It wasn't an artist guessing. There was some paper that said that once upon a time and now all the pictures kind of look like that. But at the same time, when you're saying, you know, this is what the environment looked like. These are the animals that we find there. It's not because you were, you know, just wondering or guessing. You're right. that There's a lot of evidence that supports these interpretations. Exactly. It's just like... Uh... Uh, we find uh, dinosaur footprints all over the world. Mm -hmm. And where you find dinosaur footprints, you never see a tail drag mark. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs never drag their tails. When I was growing up, you know, T-Rex walked around like Godzilla yeah. on two legs with his tail behind him. That's not true. Uh, we never see a tail drag mark when we see dinosaur footprints. There's a great trackway in Utah where we were digging, and they were all teenage dinosaurs. We can tell by the size of the track. We can tell what direction they were moving because they always put their front foot uh, impression is always in front of the back foot impression. We tell so much about these creatures. Uh, you know, when you see an alligator or a crocodile walking to the water on, on Nova or on a TV show, yeah. they're dragging their tails behind them. Dinosaurs never did that. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a long neck dinosaur, uh, a Brachiosaur, Diplodocus, Camarasaurus, their tails are sticking straight out because we never find a tail drag mark where we find their footprints. Mm -hmm. And... Um... I think one of the things that we, we should mention is uh, in the film, Grant uncovers what is a fully articulated, almost entirely prepared fossil. Yeah. Right? And, and so that works with Spielberg saying, all right, let's show this fossil has great teeth and great claws. And so that's storytelling, yeah. but like with a lens instead of, you know, narrative. And that's good. You know, show, don't tell. And so here is a fearsome you know, animal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that works for, for Hollywood. But, I mean, yes. it, it that's not representative of what you would usually... It, although, like the fish, when you open a... I mean, you found some of those fish, some beautiful bird specimens have been found where you do find a, a really, really well-preserved, full, fully articulated yep. uh, specimen, but massive <laughs> velociraptors are less common. Very rare. It's yeah. very rare. Uh, again, the conditions have to be just right to be preserved that way. they got to be buried very quickly so no scavenger activity can happen. Uh, got to be buried in uh, very calm environments and buried very quickly. Otherwise, the scavengers will get to it. And you're right, the fish, I, I dig out in Wyoming, uh, the Green River Formation, and there we find hundreds and hundreds of fish that are absolutely perfectly articulated. Mm -hmm. Some even you can find the scales and the gill, the gill covers are, are, are perfect. Wow. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it depends on the fossilization and it depends on how quickly they're covered. And those are really old. You're saying some of them are like 300 million years old. Um, the fish actually are 50 million years old. Okay. The stuff we find here in Alpena, uh, those are about 360, 370 million years old. Yeah. You got it. So maybe we'll get into the trilobites a little bit, but you got really old stuff and lots of yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing I, how well I, those I, are I, preserved. I, I, yeah, I have a, a traveling museum exhibit on trilobites. It's about 3,000 square feet, 3,500. 3, and I've got trilobites in there from 550 million years ago all the way up to when trilobites finally became extinct about 230 million years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they long preceded the dinosaurs. They were Actually, they were so common during the Cambrian period that Cambrian was called the age of trilobites. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, they were, they were quite, quite prolific. There were over 20,000 different species of those guys. Yeah, and so I was looking into it a little bit. I don't know a tremendous amount about trilobites, but to discover that there is, they had longevity. They came in all kinds of different shapes and sizes and had performed different functions in in different ecosystems. Like they did, they did it all. They were the dinosaurs of their age for sure. They yeah. they were yeah. all over. What what are some of the if you were to inspire someone to look more into trilobites? What would you uh, what would you tease them with? Wow. Um... Well, they were the first creature on Earth that had developed eyes. They had eyes kind of like a fly. Wow. Uh, they had multi-celled, uh, multi-lens eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, they were usually semicircular on top of the head. These guys could see, well, you, you know when you try to swat a fly. Okay. You know, they fly away before you can get to them. <laughs> well, trial bus had that same kind of vision. They could probably see everything around them. They could disappear, you know, before any predators could come and get them. They're... Uh, 
tremendously varied creature from you know less than an eighth of an inch to some over two feet long all different kinds of body styles and shapes there are some that have many spines sticking off the the head section and off the thorax mm -hmm. their tail sections have spines just a variety of them and normally when you find trial bites when you find a good location you'll find complete trial bites not just bits and pieces a lot of times when you find a trial bite you'll find a, a head section or a tail section but sometimes you find the complete creature uh, and they're just fascinating. They're just absolutely fascinating. And pardon me, are those the ones that are closer to home? They're in the, the Michigan area? Yeah, we got trial yeah. bites in Michigan. I also go to New York and Ohio to dig those guys. There's a place in Utah. Utah is great. Yeah. If you ever want to travel and, and have a vacation, Utah is great. Because in Utah, they have uh, rocks exposed from the Cambrian period all the way through to modern times. So you can find trial bites. And about 100 miles away, you can find dinosaurs. And 100 miles away, you can find... Uh, uh, these creatures so it's a it's a great place to go and, and wander that'd be so confusing <laughs> but amazing at yeah. the same time yeah. well that's that's one of the things that gets me too is a lot of people and, and this i hate this we've got people that go down to florida and they pick up shark's teeth mm -hmm. and then they come up to michigan and the guy's trying to be smart and try to give something for kids to do and he and he throws shark's teeth out on the beach okay and then i'll, I'll have a kid come to me and say look i found this gorgeous shark's tooth on the beach we had sharks here how do you tell this kid that some guy yeah. came up and threw shark teeth on the beach you know and that's 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 confusing to try to try to explain that to the poor kids yeah, I guess his heart was in the right place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about in your collection? Do you have any insects trapped in amber? Uh, yeah, I do. Oh, uh, yeah? I've got a couple of nice ones. I've got the obligatory mosquito in amber. I've got uh, flies, gnats, uh, spiders, and that's pr pretty much about it. Uh, actually, we just were at the rock show this, this past weekend, and we sold almost every one we had. Oh, yeah? We had over 70 uh, insects in amber. We only got nine left. So it was a it was a great show, but yeah, and you cannot get DNA out of an insect, no. <laughs> uh, not out of amber. What's really nasty is that that people are faking the amber now. Uh, oh no, it's it's called copal, and they're in, inserting stuff into it. Like if you find a scorpion yeah. in a piece of amber, it's it's faked. It's not real. They can actually take the tree sap and they can heat it up to a certain temperature and make it look like like amber. And I just wish people would do that. But anytime you find something of value, people will try to mm -hmm. make money off of that. And, mm -hmm. and the insects and amber, especially mosquitoes and amber, after the move, first movie Jurassic Park, boom, you know, it was everywhere. Everybody wants one. For sure. Did you have specimens like that pre-1993? Uh, yeah, I did. Actually, one of my first uh, fossils, I, I did purchase one about 45, 50 years ago. I got a little bit of a fossil here. <laughs> I, I purchased some amber. I want to get a, a well-rounded collection. I purchased a bug from the La Brea Tar Pits, a very large beetle about an inch and a half long. So I try to build my collection that way. And the stuff way back then, uh, that's real. Nobody yeah. was faking those kind of things back then. So like, and actually, I do have a cane. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> and I have a, a piece of amber on top with a mosquito. There's a company, I don't know, it's a Hollywood company that sells the 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 amber the insect and amber the mosquito and amber and I've got one of those because with my glasses my hat and the way I dress yeah. a lot and my beard a mm -hmm. lot of kids say you're John Hammond you know you're you're, you're the guy and I no I'm not but you know, I still wear <laughs> I still wear the clothes and the hat yeah. and the glasses and I have my cane so when the movie came out did you do you scurry back to your amber collection go wondering maybe maybe I got something like it felt. Now, I was a child, but it felt when that first film came out that the uh, zeitgeist felt, man, cloning could be a thing. Like, maybe we are just a matter of time before we clone a dinosaur. It wasn't, it hadn't been, you know, poo-pooed yet. Well, or, or at least we, broadly poo-pooed, anyhow. Not really. I, I knew right <laughs> off the bat that, that, that was, you know, you're talking sci-fi. Yeah. Especially with the, with the movie. In the first part, when they're down on the ground, you know, sweeping, that's as close as they got to real paleontology. <laughs> Uh, after that, the drilling of the amber and yeah. the uh, extraction of the DNA and, and marrying it with amphibian DNA, it, it's just not possible. However, mm -hmm. if you want to really scare your audience out there, there are scientists right now at Harvard and some in South Korea that are saying the mammoth will walk the earth again mm -hmm. in, in about six years because we have the ability to take the mammoth DNA and work with that, and we're trying to uh, try to we're trying to clone a mammoth right now. Wow. Um, unfortunately, with dinosaurs. And the, the, cool. there's just anything that's there, any organic matter is so badly degraded, you can't can't do much with it. Now, there are some paleontologists that have found some 
proteins and they found some elements, you know, in stuff that was buried in anoxic conditions and mm. was preserved in just, just the right way. But really, there's nothing there to work with. You know, Dr. Horner, who's actually the uh, one of the consultants for the movies, he's been he's got a team that's working right now on that kind of stuff. But mm. I just never, never can see it happen. Yeah, he was trying to, he is trying to, or I, I think he is. Was it reverse engineering a uh, chicken? Reverse, yeah. They're yeah. trying to reverse engineer. Trying to, uh, they take chicken eggs and, and you know they're yeah they're they're working on it. Getting uh, just tweaking the chromosomes to get the get it to retain its tail and, and yeah get the long tail and get it to have some teeth and things like that yeah that's interesting uh, reverse engineering is a way to do it but uh, boy it takes forever well the trick with the mammoth is what we've learned is don't include frog dna and then it should be okay <laughs> that's right uh-huh. frogs and salamanders just don't don't cut it you get really small mammoths <laughs> that spontaneously change gender um and i saw you mention during one of your your videos that you've actually during an excursion uh when your field trips had an eagle was it that plopped down right beside yeah. you out in the field? I was actually digging uh, with Bacher. Now, Bacher and Horner hate each other. Oh, they no. are <laughs> polar, polar opposites of the scale. They seem like um, that, yes. Oh, it, it, it's great. Uh, but I was digging with Bacher, and he's a, he's a genius. And you know, yeah. ba- uh, um, uh, Horner is, too. I mean, they really love what they do. They they do it quite well. Well, Bacher, we were out in the field, and we're digging uh, in Como Bluff, the very famous area where we had the dinosaur wars. Cope and Marsh were right. fighting back okay. and forth. For the dinosaur bones, and I was uh, I was the first day, and uh, you know we're digging at about six thousand, seven thousand feet above sea level, and I'm getting kind of hot, so I <laughs> kind of walked off the dig site, walked around on the side of the hill there, and I sat down on a big old rock uh, with a you know, bottle of water. I just kind of sat there for about a half an hour, and all of a sudden this eagle is flying around up above me, and he comes down, and within twenty yards of me, he sits down on a tree branch and just sits there, and he looks at me, and I look at him, and we just sat, kind of sat there. It was a beautiful moment. To just you know, I, I hate to say commune with nature, yeah. but that that was it. I was just enjoying enjoying the view, enjoying the experience of dig. It was my very first dinosaur dig experience. I was enjoying the experience, and then I I could enjoy that eagle, wow. that modern day raptor. That's uh, yeah. I was gonna say there you are. You're you're facing off against raptors in the wild too. Yep. Just yeah. like out of the movie. Oh, that's really I, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know them personally by any stretch of the means, but uh, the Horner and, and Bacher spectrum, they, they both seem to be provocative in, in great ways for, for this field. Yeah. They were in all the movies when I was growing up, that's for sure. I, right. You know, and same. actually, you know, the guy, there was an actor in, in uh, at yeah. least two of the episodes of Jurassic Park that was supposed to be Bacher with the straw hat yeah. and, and the yeah. long beard. And, and that was Horner yeah. deciding to poke him a little. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think they they always um, came out saying, "Here's what you don't know about dinosaurs," and and that was, I think, what the what made them, if if, if controversial, at least uh, worthy of getting attention really, for sure. What's really cool is Bacher would challenge us. Um, our crew would come in for breakfast the next morning, and you know we'd find a whole bunch of stuff, and he'd come over and talk about it, and he'd come in in the morning and say, "Okay, what did you find? Okay, what did that tell you?" You found this. Does this mean this, or what does it mean? And you had to feed back to him what you found and what your thoughts were. For example, we were digging in an area where we found lots and lots of very small crocodile teeth. Mm-hmm. We also found lots of broken turtle scutes. Eventually, we worked it out that that was a backwater eddy where baby crocs would go and live and grow and eat until they became mature enough to go out into the main channel where they wouldn't get eaten by other crocs. Mm-hmm. So we found lots and lots of baby croc teeth. We did find one or two large croc teeth, but basically little ones. We found a raptor claw, but that's all we found. You know, so something died somewhere up river and got washed into this backwater eddy. Uh, we see where there were uh, larger rocks, and what would happen is some of these smaller ma- pieces of material, the teeth and and bones and scutes, would go over the rock and get stuck behind the rock, the downstream side, showing us that that rock right there, that backwater eddy, would, would catch those those things. So when we look at the larger dinosaurs, we actually, well, the dinosaur I found, we found a lot of other dinosaur parts with it. Because again, they would wash down river, and because it was a big jumble of very large bones from a diplodic, from a Camarasaurus, those bones would get stuck behind those bones. They wouldn't travel any further down river. So many really cool things about it. Well, however much you resemble John Hammond, you also got a bit of Indiana Jones in you. And uh, yeah. that whole element of it belongs in a museum. But also at the same time, it, it's uh, an exhibit that the whole world can enjoy, and and you do these, uh, you have these traveling exhibits. You mentioned the the big one. You just you, was it this weekend? You're out. 
Oh, I was at I was at a rock show this week. Rock show this weekend. Exhibit, yeah, one of the exhibits is actually opening in October in uh, Midland, and another one is opening in January down in Jackson, Michigan. Amazing. Well, the, you know, I, I collect this stuff, and um, I can't see putting it in my house, yeah. uh, leaving it in the basement, you know, that's where people can't see it. And I used to work as a museum director in a, in a former life, mm -hmm. and I hated wearing a suit and tie. I wanted to get back in the field. So I learned about museum exhibitry, and from that point, I started creating my own exhibits. And now those exhibits are turning the world or turning the country not the world yet turning the country so people can actually see these things and i have a lot of people that argue and uh, this is another argument in paleontology they don't want amateurs going out picking up stuff because mm -hmm. then it's lost to science well my point is i'm picking it up and i'm bringing it to the people that normally wouldn't see it mm -hmm. uh, and there's a huge divide between the paleontologists that, that are pure you know, it belongs in a museum and nowhere else, and the ones that say, hey, you know, dig it up because it'll be gone soon. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of a, a, the person that believes that get this out for the public to see uh, so they can experience stuff. So much stuff goes into a basement in a museum. The American Museum of Natural History, I went there doing research on a book, and I spoke with Dr. Mark Norell, and he took me into their uh, bone storage. There are bones in jackets with the names of Barnum <laughs> Brown and, Coke and yeah. you know, all these paleontologists from the you know early 1900s, 1800s, the bones are still in jackets. They haven't been even opened. We don't even know what's in there. Those could be brand new species of dinosaurs. We don't know, yeah. but they haven't yeah. even been opened. So again, you know, you put it in a museum, put it in a basement where nobody will ever see it, or do you take it out to the public so they can see and, and experience and enjoy the stuff? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. No, 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 not at all. People don't, don't tune in to listen to me, that's for sure. And, and to your point, you hear it often. Um, many of the new species, which are named over the last five years or so, are, are specimens which had been excavated 100, 50, 60, 20 yeah. years ago that yeah. either have been finally looked at or looked at again and, um, yeah. and, and discovered to be distinct from a holotype and therefore given a new species or genus name. And so yeah. like that, that is not uncommon. That happens all the time that a fossil, all and time. you're saying there's ones yeah. that don't even get that close to being named. So. Right. There's the modern technology and tools that we have to study these things uh, really do help us. Uh, you know, we change the name sometimes. Uh, uh, we call it one thing and all of a sudden we now it's a different species, so we call it something else. Yeah. Uh, that happens quite often. And even when we find a new dinosaur, it takes easily, easily five years before it even makes it out to the public knowledge. You know, we we have to study it, and, and there's so much goes into it, describe it, then uh, put it out for peer review. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen before we actually tell the public that we found a new dinosaur. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I imagine it takes, like, uh, you'll see when something was published, but it may not have been... Yeah excavated or a couple or even found in the field for yeah it could take right. years i can't well geez they had the um i'm trying to think if it was a uh, zool or boreal pelta that they said it took you know many thousands of hours to get the get the specimens out of the rock just in the right. preparatory lab yeah you know it's well, been for a great example of that is um the the camarasaurus out yeah. in utah we found his femur and the femur is, you know, six feet long, but it's going down at a 45 degree angle into the sandstone. Mm -hmm. So it took us four years to get that one femur out of the ground because we had to dig around it uh, enough that we could get underneath it. We could wrap it in a jacket and then roll it over. That's the process we use to actually get the bones out of the field. Sometimes we're able to get a whole pod. Like in the movie, you saw that one mm -hmm. velociraptor. Probably we could have gotten that in a whole pod, one big group and take it out. But uh, again, we try to remove the bones one at a time to prevent damage, yeah. damaging the other yeah. bones. We dig around it, we dig it, we put it on a pedestal. Uh, we dig several inches below where the, we think the bone is. Then we undercut it just a little bit and we uh, put tinfoil on top. The tinfoil acts as a parting agent that helps us uh, protect the bone, plus it also when we remove the jacket, it mm. removes much easier. Okay. And then we, we, do, we put the, oh, I'll tell you what. What do you got there? See that? This is a this is a vertebra from a, a hadrosaur right here. Okay. And what we've done is we put tin foil over top. Then we put the plaster jacket on it. We take strips of uh, of burlap, soak them in plaster, and then wrap the uh, bone with it. Mm -hmm. Once that's done, we undercut it the rest of the way and roll it over. Do the same thing on the other side. Plaster jacket that, and then take it out and put it in the truck. That's how we remove those bones. So uh, <laughs> sometimes we, we take larger pods. Like, for example, when I found the tibia and the fibula and the sacrum, that all had to be removed in one giant pod because right. the bones are too close together to separate them out. 
that was removed in one very big pot. And that's where the helicopters come in. <laughs> in some cases, yeah, in some cases, Horner, you know, his teams would fly out uh, because they're so remote. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get this pot of bones, they'd hook it up and fly it out with a helicopter. We were lucky. We got a flatbed trailer in there. Uh, it was out in the middle of the desert, but we still could move a flatbed out. And we took the pot and laid it on a flatbed and hauled it out that way. Oh, that's such an adventure. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a riot. It's a riot. You do you do quite a bit of the prepara- preparation for some of the fossils yourself. Preparation, uh, yes. That's yes. incredible. So, like, how like lo- they, they must range in different times. How much commitment they are to, to unveil, but how close and personal do you get to to a to a specimen when you're going over them? It's it's, it's tremendous. Yeah. Um, what we do is uh, a lot of times we have uh, different uh, air uh, jackhammers, air scribes, yeah. uh, depending on the on the the matrix around it uh, quick example in utah the matrix is a very hard sandstone matrix so we have a, a tool we call that call it me 9100 and that's a, a jackhammer co- uses compressed air mm-hmm. in uh, south dakota when i was there a couple of years ago it's a very sandy soil you use a, a pick uh, or an ice pick or a screwdriver even to break away some of the matrix and the bones come out and they're pretty much complete you still have to jacket them but they're mm-hmm. they're not as hard to get out of the ground when you finally bring them back to the lab you cut the jacket you take the top off of it you know use a bone saw a saw just like a doctor uses to cut you know the uh, the jacket off and you remove the jacket and then you start prepping it again if it's hard rock use a, a very small uh, mini jackhammer then you can also use a uh, micro aerobrader we use that when we do more of the invertebrates like the trial bites the aerobrader is just a mini sandblaster. Again, it runs off of compressed air and it blows the dolomite powder, uh, aluminum uh, powder, whatever powder you happen to be using, by sodium bicarbonate, blows it at a very high pressure and that right. actually kind of sandblasts yeah. the matrix away from the fossil. So that's, that's really quite unique. And then sometimes I have to fix them, glue them back together. We have our own glues that we use. It's kind of like crazy glue. Mm-hmm. It's a... Uh, uh, we take plastic beads, and actually Black Hills Institute, the Larsons uh, have some of that. Uh, we take the plastic beads and melt them in acetone, right. and we get this right. beautiful liquid. Uh, once we get the liquid to the consistency we want, we spread it on the bone. The acetone evaporates very quickly, and it leaves the plastics behind, thereby stabilizing the bone so it won't break anymore. Uh, I've had bones that break open, and you can look inside. You can't see any bone marrow because there isn't any marrow, but you can see where the marrow was. You can see the different layers of, of the bone. You just glue it back together. I think in the book, in the trailer that they, they have on, lo- on location at the dig site, they have a bunch of chemical baths that they had specimens in. But it doesn't sound like you guys do that too much. <laughs> No, uh, we do use chemical uh, from time to time, uh, but I I don't like using chemicals because if you don't get all the acids off, uh, they'll continue to deteriorate the bone material and be gone. So I don't I don't like to use chemicals. We do use them. Yeah. Interesting. So you you mentioned that it's um, there's a there's a pro and a con to to waiting for for one of the uh, museums to come and academically retrieve a fossil. At the same time, there's a there's a harm when you've got a you know an amateur that. Uh, is grabbing a fossil, uh, and then there's the the wonderful coincidence when somebody who knows what they're doing gets the fossil. <laughs> um, have any of the the materials that you've been able to work on uh, been used in a publication at all? No, but oh. um, I have found a, a, a fish plate up in Alpena that I uh, took it to one of the leading experts in Devonian fish, and he looked at it and said, "I've never seen anything like this." Mm-hmm. So from that, I started doing research. I'm researching right now. Um, going to museums across the country, researching every publication I can, uh, and I'm going to be writing a paper about it. Uh, hopefully, it's a new species. If it is, you know, great. If not, well, at least I, I gave it a shot. But no, I haven't done any, uh, any published any pro- uh, professional papers yet. But that would be my first. So when you go to name a new species, what goes through your head? How are you gonna, <laughs> how are you gonna decide? Is it gonna be Latin? Is it gonna be Greek? Are you gonna, what are you gonna do? Well, the the Linnaean Society takes care of that, a lot of that for us. Okay. Um, uh, Carl Linnaeus came up with binomial nomenclature in the form, the way of naming naming everything on Earth—a mouse, a worm, a bird, <laughs> a butterfly, even plants. So basically, the genus of the the thing that I found is probably Prototitanictus. That's the genus name of, of this fish. Mm-hmm. And then the uh, the species name. A lot of times, they let the person who discovers it name it. Uh, I don't know if we're going to go with. Uh, uh, Kodalai, you know, is for my last name. Right. Or my daughter, when she was little, she had a little plastic dinosaur she called Elvis. That might end up being Prototitanictus Elvis. Oh, wow. 
that's tough choices. That's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. that's a really tough one. Well, that's cool. And another part of the outreach that you do, um, we've seen this. I watched it. Uh, you you field some really bizarre questions, and you do it uh, with a smile. And you, you, I, I watched one television like you're on TV, and and they asked you whether or not the fossils were put there in the ground for you to find, or um, or whether they were. <laughs> Uh, actually animals that were buried I, so there are people like questioning the validity of dinosaurs as existing who had never heard of what a triceratops is it's it get caught on tv like this uh, but you do a terrific job of um i guess uh, what's right compassionately or informatively kindly moving forward with questions like that being out in the public you mentioned you have people show you different unusual things <sighs> What's your approach to, in terms of being a science communicator, um, dealing with people who maybe be coming from just completely different backgrounds you can't expect? It's, it's hard. I, I get a lot, uh, especially um, when I'm traveling in the areas uh, that are heavily religious. Funny story, um, when I lived in New York, uh, one of my best friends was a pastor, and he was a strict believer that the earth is 6,000 years old. And I said, how, how can you believe that? I'm out there digging these things that are millions of years old. They're stuck in rock. And he said, well, God created those with age. And he put them there to test our faith. So, you know, I, we can politely disagree about that. And that's kind of how I approach everything is a lot of people have ideas and opinions. And my job is not to change their opinions and, and things like that. My job is to try to educate them and get them to see there might be other possibilities. Again, when I'm digging in a rock, you know, and I find something that's that old, you know, how did it get there? You know, you can see these wonderful shapes in the rock. Those are not created by geology. Well, yeah, they are, but they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not. They're not rocks. They're not, you know, boulders and cobbles. They're, they're they're they look like bones. They look like creatures. They look like leaves. Whatever they are, and you want to try to explain it to the to the people, whether they're children or adults, that. This, this is what this is. And you explain the fossilization process, how things fossilize, and then you bring it to modern times. A great yeah. example of that is when I talk about the rivers. I say, have you ever seen the, the nature shows where the wildebeests are jumping into the rivers in Africa, swimming across the river, and a crocodile grabs them and, and starts to eat them, and some of them don't get grabbed by uh, alligators and crocs, they drown. They wash downstream, and they get stuck on sandbars in the middle of the river. Then they get covered up with sand. Do you see that? That's what happened 65 million years mm -hmm. ago. So I try to bring modern experiences to them for them to see, oh, that's right. That That's how it happens today. So you try to compare today with, with the past. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do you keep like a running tally of all the neat stuff that you've you've found out there? Even if you didn't get to keep <laughs> it, like it, maybe Bacher had precedence and so he got to keep it. But what, what sort of thing, like do you have a running tally of all the interesting stuff that you found? Yeah, I uh, I try to keep some some record of it. Uh, I've got a memoir that that I'm I'm working on where I keep a record of it. Oh. Uh, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff I I, I I don't keep dinosaur bones unless I find them on private property. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot you know, like when I dig with the Burpee Museum, you can't keep those bones. No. They go to the museum. When I dig in South Dakota with the team that's out there, I don't get to keep them. Mm -hmm. They keep them. Uh, so basically. Uh, the only time you f you get to keep dinosaur bones if you find them on private property with the permission of the landowner, mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff, all the legal stuff. As far as invertebrate material, um, invertebrates are so common that they let you keep everything that you find. Okay. <laughs> um, so really, it's 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 kind of interesting. And I do find a lot of neat stuff. Yeah. And uh, again, using that museum exhibit uh, idea, I've got three, actually four museum exhibits. One is called Fossils of the Michigan Basin, where I put together uh, a, a combination of everything I found over the last 35 years into an exhibit that explains that Michigan at one time was underwater, you know, uh, back there in the Devonian period. And it shows them graphically, I've got charts and maps and graphs and pictures to show them that. Then I've got my uh, dinosaur prep lab where I actually have bones that I take to a museum. And I, I'll set up a prep lab there and I'll do prep uh, of the bones to show the public what we do. Now, that a lot of museums you go to, they have that, but the guys are behind glass. Mm. You can't talk to them. Now, some museums have gotten better. They do have the prep people talking to the public, but I'll sit there and I'll talk to the public, explain what I'm doing, how I make my glues. And then I've got uh, uh, another exhibit. Oh, my trial bite exhibit, the big one, yeah. uh, 3,500 square feet. And that one has been traveling since 2005. So uh, that's where I kind of keep a record of what I've discovered, yeah. the neat things I've found is in those traveling exhibits. 
So I'm kind of out of questions. Was there anything that you really wanted to talk about? We haven't talked about Jurassic Park much. No, really. Um, <laughs> These are all related to Jurassic Park. <laughs> well, kind of a little bit. We keep trying to trying to bring it back to it. I, I think those movies are fantastic. Yeah. Um, they are uh, fanciful. They are uh, educational to some point. They are entertaining by, by far. They're mm -hmm. entertaining. And it gives people an idea. Now, since Jurassic Park came out, what happened to the paleontology world? Everybody is interested in dinosaurs. Yeah. Now, we've always kind of been interested in dinosaurs, but ever since Jurassic Park, it has just exploded. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wants to know more about it. So that's it, a great thing that that movie is out. A lot of the stuff is just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have, you know, Blue running around, you know, you know, doing uh, humans bidding and chasing people down. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that... Uh, it, it's a great thing that, that we're educating the public, at least in some fashion, to make them question, mm -hmm. make them challenge, make them think about what was going on. They know? make an so, interesting dinosaur touchstone that there's a common yeah. experience and that you can segue from in a meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really yeah. good point. Do you, have you found there's a big difference between the, the dinosaur surge in the, the 90s versus the dinosaur surge that came when Jurassic World uh, returned? What I've seen is the it's more been more fantasy as the as the movies progressed mm -hmm. and it's really confusing kids a lot yeah. um they're not really showing now this is a tough one too because velociraptor actually is not as big as it was in the movies the velociraptor is only about the size of a german shepherd is that how tall they are they're you know maybe five or six feet long with their tail and their head sticking out but they're only about as tall as a german shepherd mm -hmm. um you think about that and we also have been trying to, we, I, I haven't been doing it, but paleontologists have been talking to the guys, producers, give the velociraptor feathers. Yeah. Velociraptor had feathers. Um, that's a difficult one, too. Now, everybody is now accepting, the, not everybody, most people are accepting the fact that velociraptor had feathers. And actually, in movie number, which one now, they gave one of them, like, three little feathers on top of his head. Yeah. Now, the yeah. new movie coming out, you saw the trailer, he's covered in feathers, you know, so they're slowly going that, that way. But again, a lot of fantasy. When you see the sizes of some of these creatures, the mosasaur that jumps out of the water and grabs a shark, way too big. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to tell the kid, no, he wasn't that big. You know, So uh, I see uh, it's getting a lot more fantasy rather than you know closer towards reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It keeps people's attention, doesn't it? Who, it who does. knows it what really comes does. next, eh? Yeah. Who knows how it's all going to segue from here because this kind of feels like the, the closure of the second trilogy and... Uh... We, we, well, we, if you look at, uh, again, again, for example, I, I, a lot of kids just love Spinosaurus. Yeah. And when Spinosaurus kills T-Rex, they, they really love that. Well, he could never have done that. First of all, they're on different continents. So, you know, di mm -hmm. put those differences aside. The Spinosaurus jaw was not strong enough to grab the back of the T-Rex and break his neck. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spinosaurus jaw is more of a fish-eating jaw. It's very thin. It's very fragile. To be able to, to put down that kind of bite force to break break the neck and tear it wouldn't wouldn't happen so again you try to explain that to, to people and you know they they get it you know they get it actually. the spinosaur didn't even use bite force he used his hands and he did like that schwarzenegger uh navy seal yeah. training bit on his neck to like get him like, <laughs> yeah. so he got he got training in there somewhere that's, that's called that's the that's hollywood that's hollywood well, he should have done a drop kick while he was at it i guess <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been uh, such a terrific interview with uh, Paleo Joe. If you want to learn more about Paleo Joe, visit paleojoe.com. That's right. Yeah, paleojoe.com is my uh, website. I've got a lot of great things there. I've got teacher resources. Uh, um, I have coloring pages. I've got stories. I've got some of my adventures are there. My YouTube channel shows a lot of different things. I do show how to prep certain fossils. Mm -hmm. I talk about some of my you know, Michigan, local Michigan adventures. Um, there's a fossil of the week on there. Uh, also, at the far end of the uh, tab on top, I do have a store. Mm -hmm. I do sell fossils, uh, uh, mostly all invertebrates. I don't sell much vertebrate material because you, you can't get it, you can't sell it. Yeah. Uh, but I do have a lot of fossils on, on that site if you want to buy some. Uh, also, there's contact. Uh, you know, If you want to contact me, ask some questions or anything like that, great. I also explain my three museum exhibits. So all you museum guys out there, if you want a museum <laughs> exhibit, you know, give, me a, give me a holler. So. For sure, and you can uh, you can find the while they're still in in stock the the uh, insects and amber. <laughs> yep. While they're still there, and pro I promise you, if uh, if you think he sounds good in audio, he looks great in video. The uh, the videos are really good. The, the imagery when you're showing the vertebrae and showing the the processes and stuff like that, it really 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 brings the education to to the forefront. It's really good. 
Um, do you still, in your collection, have your autograph from John Candy? Well, you know, John was just a really nice guy, but no, never got it. I, I tried getting on the, on the set of Spaceballs, and, and even, you know, Home Alone was really cool. I really wanted to get into the back of that vehicle and help with that oom ba band. Yeah. I just never could get in there. <laughs> yeah, I was escorted right from the lot, so that didn't work. <laughs> well, thank you again. Thank you so much for coming on. I, what a big thrill this is. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Take care. Big thanks to Paleo Joe for coming on the show. That's incredible. Let's get into our chapter for today, New York, spanning from pages 23 to 26. In a synopsis, we've got Dr. Richard Stone receiving the lizard specimen at the Tropical Diseases Laboratory in New York because the specimen's intended recipient, Dr. Simpson, is unavailable for the summer. The sample comes with a picture drawn by Tina to help identify the lizard. X-rays and Polaroids of the sample are taken. They test for communicable diseases, and finding none, answer Dr. Gutierrez that the lizard is safe, which Marty believes. Meanwhile, three of these green lizards prey upon a newborn baby at the Bahia Anasco Clinic. Which characters do we have? Uh, we meet Dr. Richard Stone, head of the Tropical Diseases Laboratory of Columbia University Medical Center. There is a comfortable routine in his lab. TDL technician, this woman is sarcastic, nonplussed with receiving a partially masticated fragment of unidentified Costa Rican lizard. She wrinkles her nose at that. She wonders why they received a reptile, because it's not a disease, of course. Uh, upon seeing the specimen, she remarks, huh, looks eaten, as if she were evaluating the specimen with fresh eyes, even though the label clearly says that it's partially masticated. That's the first thing she wrinkles her nose over just before opening the thing. So she knew that. It's bizarre. Uh, we have Ed Simpson. The previously identified magnate of herpetological identification, he's on a field trip to Borneo for the summer, so he uh, is unavailable, and he has a secretary. Ed Simpson's secretary. She calls ahead saying that the lizard sample comes with a request to identify if it may be carrying any communicable diseases. We have Elena Morales, who returns. She's the midwife from earlier. The wizened, or the wizened midwife from the introduction returns. Working by flashlight, she hears chirping and goes to inspect the newborn believing that it's a rat that's chirping, or more likely just a bird. And there's a mother. A new mother at the clinic in Bahia, Nasco, is resting just after midnight. Some localities that the, the story takes place in. We have New York, the city of New York, where the Tropical Diseases Laboratory is located, filled with New Yorkers who travel abroad and bring back diseases, which the TDL must identify and remedy. The TDL, the Tropical Diseases Laboratory, run by the Columbia Medical Center, based in New York City. In the early 20th century, when the laboratory occupied the entire fourth floor of the biomedical research building, crews of technicians worked to eliminate the scourges of yellow fever, malaria, and cholera. But medical successes and research laboratories in Nairobi and Sao Paulo have left the TDL a much less important place than it once was, says on page 23. A fraction of its former size, only two full-time technicians remain, and they are primarily concerned with diagnosing illnesses of New Yorkers who have traveled abroad. There is a comfortable routine in the lab. Protocols include using air handlers, plastic gloves, and face masks when handling unidentified specimens, as outlined on page 24. They've recently identified specimens containing the Venezuelan equine fever, Japanese bee encephalitis, cayenne sewer forest virus, Langat virus, and Mayaro. I cannot tell you if I pronounced any of that correctly. We have the Columbia University Medical Center, which is based in New York City. There's Nairobi, where medical successes are located, and they've drawn business away from the TDL, and the capital is in Kenya, or Kenya. Uh, Sao Paulo, medical successes located here have drawn business away from the TDL, and, uh, and this is a huge city in Brazil. Ed Simpson's lab, the partially masticated fragment of unidentified Costa Rican lizard was sent from this lab to the TDL, so it would have gone from one place in New York City to the next. Borneo, where Dr. Simpson is working for the summer, is named in Bahia and Nasco, where the rain continues to hammer down onto the clinic and the power is out. What plot points do we do we move past in this section here? Tina's drawing of the lizard goes to New York. I think that was a, a Sesame Street special, wasn't it? Tina's drawing goes to New York. Uh, and an x-ray is taken of the specimen. And the greed lizards prey upon a baby in a bassinet at the Bahia and Nasco Clinic. Uh, we have some stylistic techniques to review. Uh, more metaphors. The biological specimen container is, quote, plastered with stickers and warnings of four languages, which does a good job suggesting how it is covered all over with stickers. There's uh, some more similes. The green lizards crouched like gargoyles. This is terrific because gargoyles are commonly portrayed bearing their teeth 
and likely they're grasping for something before them, and of course, they're meant to portray hideous demons. What an apt description of this horrible moment when a newborn baby has fallen prey to a pack of lizards. And then following right after that, leaving only bloody three-toed tracks like birds. Here, as if we needed to have it spelled out any clearer, Crichton employs a final simile saying that it leaves tracks like birds to reinforce that yes, these are the same lizards as the one that bit Tina and were described by Tina. And now there's a pack of them, and they are killing. Uh, we have literary techniques. We have pacing kind of like a boomerang. Uh, the narrative in this chapter is like a boomerang. We start in Costa Rica, where the lizard sample is couriered to New York. From there, it's thought out, analyzed, and the response is returned to Costa Rica. And it ends right where we started, in Bahia, Nasco. Dialogue. Crichton uses dialogue in the first page to provide some exposition of why the intended specialist is unable to deal with the request. So it's show, don't tell with dialogue instead of just the narrator saying it. And Stone and the technician show some professional courtesy by agreeing with observations. So we get a, a bit of a, a taste of the, the rapport between them in the lab. Crichton, however, is getting a bit redundant. When they open a clearly labeled specimen that says that it's partially masticated, it's entirely redundant for the specialist to look at the specimen right after and agree, yes, it looks eaten, and then talk about it being looking eaten. It's just redundant, and it sticks out and it bugged me. Uh, let's move on to our uh, discussing some of the greater themes in the book. Ecological criticism. If we're going to continue reviewing ecological criticism, I feel it's important to have a, a fundamental definition of what on earth I'm talking about going forward. But alas, my M.H. Abrams 7th edition of the Glossary of Literary Terms makes no mention of it. Terry Eagleton's 2nd edition of Literary Theory, the 2nd edition of David H. Richter's The Critical Tradition, no mention of it. So we get to turn to the good old reliable internet and what could go wrong. <laughs> Wikipedia tells us, Ecocriticism is the study of literature and the environment from an interdisciplinary point of view, where literature scholars analyze texts that illustrate environmental concerns and examine the various ways literature treats the subject of nature. That's a definition that I feel we can apply to Jurassic Park. While I may not be a literature scholar, we can still analyze Jurassic Park as it illustrates environmental concerns and then examine the various ways it treats the subject of nature. That said, that may be a limited perspective on what ecological criticism really is. Other definitions say it's the literary study that considers of the relationship that human beings have to the environment. It explores how nature and the natural world are imagined through literary texts. Reviewing literary history can help inform our contemporary attitude toward the environment, but can Jurassic Park? Causes for concerns are rooted in deforestation, air pollution, endangered species, wetland loss, animal rights, and rampant consumerism. Issues appearing as controversial in Western literature for hundreds of years, according to the Environmental Humanities Initiative at the University of California, Santa Barbara. OxfordBibliographies.com further suggests it's a broad way for literary and cultural scholars to investigate the global ecological crisis through the intersection of literature, culture, and physical environment. Now, by that definition, analyzing a text is only one of the triumvirate pieces necessary to perform the criticism, requiring analyses of both culture and the physical environment to be performed. Now, I'll posit this. Let's begin cataloging moments for consideration to include in what we hope to use in a literary analysis of Jurassic Park, reviewing where the novel illustrates concerns for the environment and afterward examine the various ways it treats the subject matter in alignment with the first definition. And if there were anyone willing and able to contribute their specialties in investigating the global ecological crisis through culture and through the physical environment, we can take our initial observations from the literary text and then investigate the intersection between literature, culture, and the physical environment. But I'll, I'll wait for your response on that. That said, with the previous definition being our informal basis, we can set a task for ourselves to catalog any concerns that are raised about deforestation air pollution, endangered species, wetland loss, animal rights, and rampant consumerism. This chapter gives us deforestation, habitat loss, and endangered species, and adds to it emerging diseases. I understand that it's considered plausible that the COVID-19 pandemic was rooted in habitat loss, where animals that host potentially dangerous pathogens that can make the jump to humans are crossing paths with humans because they're no longer protected in their own habitats but are being forced out of those habitats and, but this is really spelling it out, crossing paths with humans along with their potentially dangerous pathogens. While this green lizard with brown stripes isn't harboring a mutated coronavirus, there are concerns that this scenario that we're all so damn familiar with now could be a concern for a particular vulnerable population in Costa Rica. What have we been presented with so far to include our catalog of data for ecological criticism? 
Well, we have significant downsizing that has affected the tropical diseases laboratory bandwidth to take on unique cases like this unidentified lizard specimen. Page 23, we're told, in the early 20th century, when the laboratory occupied the entire fourth floor of the biomedical research building, crews of technicians worked to eliminate the scourges of yellow fever, malaria, and cholera. But medical successes in research laboratories in Nairobi and Sao Paulo had left the TDL a much less important place than it once was. That's on page 23. A fraction of its former size, only two full-time technicians. Funding and downsizing in ecologically focused operations in this case is a detriment to the people of Costa Rica who are eager for more data to inform their levels of risk with this new biting lizard. So we can add this to our list of items to follow with our ecological criticism. Due diligence, the lizard sample from the earlier chapter has made it to New York, was received at Dr. Stone's laboratory, and has since been referred to the TDL in Stone's absence. It's in an international biological specimen container. There's no word of the saliva sample, which was supposed to go to San Jose. And there should still be Polaroids of the bite marks at the Clinica Santa Maria kept in Punta Arenas. However, the sample is shipped with Tina's drawing of the lizard, which looks like a dinosaur. It is returned to a freezer at the TDL, the sample, but not the picture. And an x-ray and some Polaroids are taken of the sample in New York. While the specimen reacts mildly to Indian King Cobra venom, Dr. Stone did not think it was noteworthy to include that detail in the facts his technician sent to Gutierrez, which led to two outcomes. One, Dr. Gutierrez believes the lizard was positively identified as a basilisk lizard, nullifying his need to identify a new species, and that there are no communicable diseases, as the cobra venom isn't a disease, it's a poison. So Gutierrez believes there's nothing to worry about, and whereas the report is technically correct in what it states, the interpretations are consequential. There is a new invasive species, it poses a significant danger for an at-risk population in Costa Rica, and it cost lives. Building a mystery. You guys know that that's a Sarah McLaughlin reference, right? The buck has been passed on to New York, but not reached the intended recipient. Stone is on a field trip for the summer. Remember, this is in July. This lab is now, with no herpetological expert, tasked with identifying the species in hopes to screen it for new diseases. Identifying the lizard no longer becomes a priority, as the specialist is away, and the virologists are entirely unfit to diagnose a new species anyhow. The label for the lizard claims that it is a Basiliscus emiratus, with a three-toed genetic anomaly. That's on page 24. Tests quickly conclude the blood shows no significant reactivity to any viral or bacterial antigen. The blood proved to be mildly reactive to the venom of the Indian king cobra. The venom isn't a communicable disease, so they make no mention of it. And here we move on with chaos theory. Chaos theory is in this book. You know that and I know that, but it hasn't come up yet. And it's a bit tricky to wrap your head around, frankly. It comes across more as a philosophy than mathematics. And I can say I have no idea what data Malcolm has entered into his calculations to reach his conclusions. I have no clue. And I look long and hard at what chaos theory is and means. But there's the understanding that he uses meta-analysis, crunching unfathomable amounts of numbers with computers, to the chagrin of classical mathematicians who believe you should be able to do all your math on a chalkboard. They create these fractal curves moving in phase space. Somehow these models identify where unpredictability is most likely, which could lead to an acceleration of unpredictability known to you and I as chaos and into sudden collapse, which the book calls the Malcolm Effect. It is folly to suggest that every instance of unpredictability, every moment of misinterpretation or misunderstanding in this novel is somehow an application of chaos theory. Usually we'd look for a common phrase, extended metaphor, or literary technique of some sort that the author uses to, conspicuous or otherwise, evoke chaos theory to the reader's attention. Does Crichton do this? Well, we have the seven iterations which serve as something like act breaks, where the stakes are raised each time. Each iteration comes with the diagram of a fractal curve and a quote from Malcolm, which I can only guess for the time being anyhow is from his report to Hammond on the, his predictions for Jurassic Park. Is this Crichton asking that readers view his entire narrative with a chaotic lens? Hey, we're here to dig deep into Jurassic Park and see what it has to say, and I'd be crazy not to, therefore, at least catalog instances for consideration in that perspective. As we began with the ecological criticism, we need to establish the ontology of chaos theory, or the base principles that it operates upon, so that we can catalog data and then analyze it afterwards. Well, that's fairly complicated, it turns out. 
If one were interested in classifying a dynamic system as chaotic, they were required to identify three properties. That the dynamic system is sensitive to initial conditions, that the dynamic system is topologically transitive, and that the dynamic system has dense periodic orbits. I don't think I know how to do that. <laughs> I looked long and hard. I've got pages trying to explain what that could mean. And I know that I don't know what that all means. <laughs> I guess I'm asking a question to you people. Can we catalog moments in the novel that suggest chaos theory is at play in other dynamic systems like in the biotechnology industry or in the scientific industry or, or something like that? We'd have to be able to identify and catalog that those systems are sensitive to initial conditions, meaning that there are many, many variables affecting its trajectory, that it's topologically transitive, meaning its constituent parts are getting inextricably mixed, though they don't lose their geometric stability, and that there are dense periodic orbits, meaning that all the points in the phase space never repeat as they are drawn to attractors, strange or otherwise. <sighs> yeah, I don't know, man. Malcolm t will tell us later more about how to consider chaos theory, but an underlying principle is that the behavior of any system is sensitively dependent on initial conditions, and that's on page 74. This is the, quote, butterfly effect, where something small, like a butterfly flapping its wings and peaking, affects weather conditions in New York, according to Malcolm. Put more simply, little changes at the beginning produce complex behavior, which can lead to greater unpredictability. And if you set up your system to manage for initial conditions, you're in for trouble because the conditions will change unpredictably, leaving you up the creek without a paddle. In the introduction to this novel, we get a series of specialists, Gutierrez, Cruz, Simpson, and Stone, who all find something unusual about this specimen. It doesn't fit behavioral expectations. It doesn't match any known descriptions. It appears to lead to serious reactions when it bites, but it doesn't carry any communicable diseases. And as questions are asked and referred to specialists, little changes at the beginning are going to lead to flawed outcomes. Saliva samples are being thrown away. Revelations of venomous properties are going unreported, and the lizard remains unidentified. Meanwhile, the people of Costa Rica, perhaps in those little villages on the Pacific coast, are remaining uninformed of a potential risk that has life-threatening consequences for at-risk groups, namely newborns and young children. Would Malcolm's theory predict this? By the end of the novel, in a dopey stupor, Malcolm spells out how chaos theory embraces that science can't know everything, that complete control is an illusion, and that decisions based on science may be as foolish and misguided as the, quote, child who jumps off a building because he believes he can fly, on page 313. Chaos theory proves that unpredictability is built into our daily lives, says Malcolm. The grand vision of science, the dream of that total control, has died. This tableau surrounding the misadventures of the Compi fragment shows the unpredictable, chaotic, yet mundane happenings that are either incorrect, uninformed, or worse, technically correct, but answering the wrong question. But through the belief that science offers total control, decisions are made and understood to be correct. The lizard remains unidentified. Its risks to the public remain unknown. And the consequences of that include, quote, very large consequences for human life, says Malcolm on page 158. And not to get on a soapbox or philosophize outside my expertise, but life is the most precious thing in the world. Here the unpredictable happened, affecting the outcome. Gutierrez accepts the report, believing it verified the identity of the lizard as a basilisk lizard, and the absence of communicable disease implied no serious health hazards for Costa Rica. Overlooking to include Indian king cobra toxicity in the report back to Gutierrez is the butterfly flapping its wings and peeking. What happens in the bassinet, in the clinic at Bahia and Nasco, is the weather in New York. How do we tie this into earlier pages? We have superstitious Costa Ricans. Elena Morales hears chirping when she reaches for the handle to the nursery and relaxes because she thinks she's hearing a bird, which is said to be good luck on page 26. Quote, Costa Ricans said that when a bird came to visit a newborn child, it brought good luck. Here's another example where Costa Ricans, in general, have a superstition, in this case, a good omen. I believe any mischaracterization of the Costa Ricans as, quote, not especially superstitious in the prologue, the bite of the raptor, can be entirely chalked up to a misperception by the point of view character, the stranger in a strange land, Dr. Roberta Carter. The author tells us specifically that Costa Ricans do, in fact, believe in, quote, good luck, and therefore, obviously, the inverse bad luck. All the behavior from Elena Morales and Manuel Aragon, therefore, fall in line 
with them having a series of common cultural superstitions. So I think there's that settled. A horror story that said the superstition line removes some of the horror from the prologue, which I, is why I believe Crichton employed it in the first place. Here are some entirely rational people acting irrationally because of this horrifying experience. And that connects to the end of this chapter, where you're expecting something nice, some good luck, because of the reassuring sound of a bird chirping, but instead you get horror writ, writ large. Just the sight of the newborn's face informs Elena that the baby is surely dead. The animals scurry, leaving behind their horrible calling card. Three-toed footprints, just like birds. Some of that dread, some of that horror, Crichton does an extraordinary job with here. <sighs> well, moving on. So thank you, thank you very much to my special guest today, Paleo Joe. He was incredible, giving all kinds of insights about his career and uh, the work that he does, giving us a better relationship to what was actually going on in the text in Jurassic Park. It's pretty cool. I want to sign off today thanking you for joining me. If you want to read along in the book, add some thoughts to what we've been discussing on the show or be a guest on the show and chat with me about anything that you like about Jurassic Park, you can do that by connecting with me. I'm at ryansrogers at gmail.com. If you'd like to be a guest, drop me a line and we can try and set something up. We can rehash, tear down, gush over, and chit-chat about any part of the book, or also not the book, all you'd like. Jurassic Park Cast is part of the Spring Chickens banner of amateur intellectual properties, including the Spring Chicken funny pages, Tomb of the Undead graphic novel, the Second Lapse graphic novelettes, the Infantry, and the Worst of the Mall, the King Street Capers. You can find links to all that baggage in the show notes or by visiting schickens.blogspot.com or finding us on Facebook at facebook.com slash springchickencapers or me, I'm on Twitter at RogersRyan22. Thank you dearly for tuning in to the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast where we talk about the novel Jurassic Park and also not that too. Until next time.